Tibetan Buddhists around the world marched this week, commemorating the 60th anniversary of an uprising, brutally squashed by Chinese military, that forced the Dalai Lama and his followers into exile. These days, Tibet is considered one of the least free places in the world. That's because the Communist Party has developed sophisticated methods of micromanaging the plateau. Today, one of the prime requirements for every monks and nuns is that they should be loyal to the Communist Party before they are loyal to their faith. So whether it's in terms of uh, people's freedom of movement, people's uh, language, study, cultural preservation, everything is being dictated by the Chinese uh, Communist Party. In 1995, China kidnapped the six-year-old successor to the Dalai Lama, replacing him with their own party-approved Lama. He is now one of the leaders of the Buddhist Association of China, which helps present China as a friendly superpower to its neighbors. It's not just ironic that China's atheist leadership is fostering religious ties with its neighbors, it's also smart. Buddhists make up a huge proportion of the population in countries that China wants to connect to its Belt and Road Initiative, a multi-billion dollar project to dominate global trade. One goal? To get better connected to the oil-rich Middle East. So in the last decade, they've spent $2.5 billion on building oil and gas pipelines through Myanmar, directly connecting China to the Indian Ocean. In that same period, China actively worked to improve religious ties with Myanmar, a country that is 88% Buddhist. They've shared important relics with Myanmar's temples, agreed to build a Buddhist association center in the capital, and even signed an official declaration of friendly religious relations, whatever that's worth. China is now trying to cut billions more in port and dam deals with Myanmar's government. China's use of Buddhist diplomacy is significant because several of these countries are apprehensive of this giant power, whether the loans they are taking from China will drive them into a dead trap. The most recent example of that is Sri Lanka. The country's president gave the Chinese a contract to build a billion-dollar port in his hometown, after they helped him and the country's Buddhist majority win a decades-long civil war. The Sri Lankan president was convinced the port would make his supporters rich, but it didn't. And just eight years later, Sri Lanka was signing away a 99-year lease on a port located on one of the world's busiest shipping lanes as repayment. Now, Sri Lanka's experience has become a cautionary tale for several other South Asian countries. The thing is, no other country has been able to match China. Nepal might be the biggest benefactor. In 2011, it took a $3 billion loan to build the Buddha's hometown into a modern-day pilgrimage hub. Since then, China has become Nepal's largest foreign investor. And up until last year, Nepal banned its own citizens from celebrating the birthday of the Dalai Lama, the Buddhist that China hates the most. In all these countries, you find that the public feels that, uh, well, if we want improved infrastructure, it is only the Chinese who are willing to extend loans. So yes, there is concern, but there is no other alternative. 